What is up guys? Um, so today I'm training push. I'm going to talk you through the way that I personally like to structure my push sessions at the moment. And that certainly does vary. Um, but my preference is to cluster my pressing movements together. Now there's two kind of camps to approaching a, 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 a push session in the sense that you could train your chest first and then do a chest isolation movement. Then you could train your shoulders uh, second with a, a shoulder compound movement and then a shoulder isolation movement after that. And then you could finally move around to your tricep compound movement and then, do, and then finish with your tricep isolation. I personally don't like that approach. Um, I, I know many people that have had great success with it. For me, I found the best route to success when you are training a push session is to do your chest work first, your compound shoulder work second, your compound tricep work third, and then move on to your isolation movements. And the reason being is that if you think that if I do a chest fly second, and then I come to do my high incline Smith press, that would then maybe be my shoulder movement, the fatigue that will come about in my upper chest fibers from my chest fly is going to negatively impact the loading that I can use on my shoulder press. And then furthermore, if I then do a, a lateral after that, when I circle back around to doing my tricep compound, I've now done a chest isolation and a shoulder isolation, which is gonna negatively impact my ability to load my tricep compound move. When we understand the fact that loading and our ability to progress our loading is what will underpin our overall mass, in theory, in the sense that if we are able to always bring about an increase in internal stimulus as a result of the increase in external stimulus, what I mean is as more weight goes on the bar, our muscle fiber stimulus increases, which should happen if you're executing efficiently, then the more we lift, the bigger we get. And we see that in, in everything, in that the biggest bodybuilders of all time have also been the strongest, or also will have the ability to be the strongest. Now, I know in the comments section here, we're gonna say, well, what about so-and-so? There are outliers. However, when we traditionally look at the, at the biggest that carried the most amount of muscle mass, Ronnie Coleman, probably the strongest bodybuilder of all time. Now, who, do we, who would be kind of next on that list as really freaky big bodybuilders? Kai Green, again, unbelievably strong, can incline press five plates. And then we move to an outlier, Phil Heath. Maybe not as strong, because his ability to build muscle was so crazy freaky, he didn't have to lift heavy. But then the number of bodybuilders that are extremely big, that are strong, far outweighs the outliers. So when we kind of look at modern time bodybuilders, two prime examples of, of kind of the biggest, the strongest would be even Andrew Jack, who's just won two shows, absolutely ginormous, unbelievably strong. And then we think who else is in that top three? James Hollingshead, one of the strongest bodybuilders of all time. And then we kind of look at then kind of top 10, top 10 Olympia, Ian Vallier, again, unbelievably strong. It's consistent in the sense that the loading aspect will bring about great hypertrophy. So when I think about a push session, how do I get my compound moves the strongest? I bunch them together at the beginning and I don't use isolation work that will then diminish my ability to load and progress my loading. That doesn't mean that you have to do it in that manner. I would advise you trying both ways and seeing what feels the best for you and what allows you to make the best progress over time. Because as per the educational videos, there is no best. The best is what feels best for you. And my way might not be the best way for you. And I'm never gonna tell you that my way is the best way for you, but my goal is to give you the different approaches that you can use and then you take what you need and you apply it to yourself. And then you've got your way and that is the best way. Um, I'm gonna start with incline prime press today. I'm gonna to talk you through how to adjust the resistance profiles because I get these questions a lot. Now. Previously, when I was using the incline prime press, I was focusing on just middle peg loading. Now, the reason for that, for that is because it, again, in, in theory, will keep the resistance even through the whole profile. That's not actually the case with this piece. And even when you are just middle peg loading, it will overload the short slightly more, which means then when we get to that lockout period, that gets disproportionately harder as we progress our lifts, which means then you will run into a wall of a weight that you can lift. And you're limiting, you're limiting your overall progress on the movement 
because of that disproportionate resistance profile. How do we combat that? We then split our loading, even on early sets, between the top and the middle pegs, which means it keeps the ability to progress lifts consistent over a long period of time. Now, I came across this through trial and error in the sense that I probably spent about two years solely trying to progress the middle peg and I couldn't get above five and a bit plates aside for eight reps. I just couldn't, despite everything else progressing consistently as I would hope, it was as if I just couldn't overcome this, this shortening factor. I was just running into a brick wall. So then once I realized that, um, that's when I decided to start splitting the resistance profile. And the uh, way you would split your resistance profiles varies from piece to piece. So as I work towards my working sets, I'll explain how I like to now load this machine. And then you can try it and see how it feels for you. So as I warm up on this, my mid peg and my top peg at the same time. So I'm gonna go up in half a plate on each. So for my first working set, I actually like to go 50-50 now, or maybe 60% on the middle peg and 40% and on the top. But I won't go above now 60% on the middle. I just, for me personally, I don't like the limiting factor that will bring to your ability to progress the load across the machine as a whole. It took me much longer than it should have done to actually come to that conclusion. Like I said, I was hammering that middle peg for two years. It's because I'm stubborn as fuck. And I was like, I'm going to get this to like 10, 12 reps for the five plates on the middle peg. Just couldn't do it. I could. It took me, I would say, a year just to get from five reps to kind of like seven reps. And then another half a year to get to eight reps. Very, very frustrating. Um, I cost myself progress in terms of development whilst I was still trying to build muscle. Um, if I'd have just gone to uh, more sensible loading like I do now in terms of my ability to progress and create that additional internal stimulus. As I'm warming up, you'll notice that um, I don't waste energy on my warm ups. Um, I don't do very many reps on things that I, I have no intention of taking to failure. All I'm doing as I'm warming up is preparing my body for the work. If I waste energy on it, I can then get less from the sets that are gonna contribute to my development and my growth. So for those of you that are warming up, do the absolute minimum that you need to rather then work. For some of you, it might need more reps because you're gonna then avoid the potential risk of, of injury. For me, it will only be two, three uh, reps and then single reps until I'm then ready to do my work so. I have two and a half plates, middle and top. This now feels incredibly even through the whole lift. And what I mean is that the loading here feels just as heavy or just as light as it does here, which is important because on a lot of machines, specifically maybe hammer strength machines, they will have quite little resistance here in the lengthened position and then they will fully overload the shortened position, which I believe is a poor resistance profile, which is why you don't see any hammer strength machines in my gym. Um, the advantage of the prime pieces, and I, this isn't plugging prime because we didn't get these at any kind of discount. Um, I just think they're great machines. Um, we can adjust that resistance profile. Um, so right now, I'm going 50-50 and it keeps everything even. Now that I'm ready to work guys, I'm, um, I'm gonna stick on five plates total on the machine. But what I'm gonna do is, I'm actually gonna start with that slight increase on the middle peg. Like I said, a second ago, we might potentially work at 60-40. Um, so this is what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna have three plates 
three plates on the middle and two plates on the top. Now, the question then is, why would I, why would I potentially overload the shortened first? Um, and the reason being is that whilst we're fresh, that's when we're going to retain our strength in the shortened position. So if I'm going to make the most of that lockout period, this will be where I do it on my first set. So I either will go 50-50 or I'll go 60-40, depending on how I feel whilst I'm warming up. So based on those warm ups, I'm going to start on that 60-40 and then I'll adjust for my second set because as we get more fatigued, that's where we lose the ability to overload in the shortened. And then again, that's where we need to adjust the resistance profiles. And, and that's again why a, a machine like a hammer strength is so obsolete because as you get fatigued, you're still then limited in terms of the loading that you can use by what you can get in the shortened. Um, so as you get deeper and deeper into a session and more and more fatigued, then then it's really absolutely no use for a hammer strength piece at all. If you are gonna use them, I would then only use them in the first exercise that you do. After that, I wouldn't use them at all and I'd use things that only have uh, even resistance profiles if you don't have access to something that allows you to manipulate the resistance profile. The rep range that you choose is going to be entirely person dependent. If you aren't used to lifting extremely heavy, I would stick to safer rep ranges. And if your goal is solely hypertrophy, again, I would probably stick to things that are maybe in the 8 to 12 rep range. It's a great rep range to work. Equally, you are going to get fantastic results by lifting in maybe the 5 to 30 rep range because as long as you take something to absolute failure, you're going to bring about an adaptive response. For me personally, just because you're maybe going to question why I'm going to go so heavy because I'm probably going to get, only get three reps on this, maybe even only two reps. Uh, my personal goals right now are to be as strong as I possibly can be and I'm actually not hugely concerned with my muscle mass anymore because the next competition I do won't be in bodybuilding or it'll be in jiu-jitsu and where I want to actually be even lighter than I am now but still as strong as I possibly can be. Um, I'm only literally explaining that because you're, you might be wondering why I'm going to go so heavy um, and do so little reps and unless your goals are the same as mine I probably would avoid doing doubles and triples with your goal being specifically bodybuilding and hypertrophy lift a little bit lighter and get a little more uh, get a few more reps second set because I know I'm not going to have the same power in the lockout but I will still have the exact same power in the lengthened position I'm going to move from three plates to the middle to three plates at the top um, which then gives me that I still stay on five plates on the machine but my ability to load in that shortened position is now diminished but our muscles retain strength in the lengthened position phenomenally well. So again, this is my argument against reverse banding machines because, uh, or reverse banding, uh, basically anything aside from a, uh, from a hack squat. Um, the, your, you don't want to diminish your load in the lengthened position and that you only want to um, overload the shortened position when you're very fresh. So again, the only situation where I potentially would reverse band the movement would be the very first set um, of, a, of a, a whole workout. After that, I wouldn't do it. Um, and, and that applies to, to, to basically everything. Um, again, people are gonna have mixed opinions on that. Um, even people that I adore, like Joe Bennett, uh, we don't entirely see eye to eye um, with the reverse banding setup. Um, unless your setup of the reverse band is immaculate, uh, where then I can see some potential value in it. The problem being is that I don't see people setting up their reverse bands appropriately, which then makes the, the exercise obsolete because like I said, you're limiting yourself to your load on the bar by the amount that you can lift in the shortened position. 
uh, and then you're dropping off your loaded position stuff. Um, so that's, uh, again, one of the main reasons why I don't like it. Kind of regardless of your goals, guys, uh, still get up for sets however you like. Some people like getting up for sets. Some people don't. Some people need to get up for sets. Some people don't. Um, I personally still like to get fucking up for sets. Um, in my head, I still want to attack the set. Uh, for me, being aggressive in the sets will be something I always do because I enjoy doing it. Um, some people don't, and that's okay. So, do whatever you've got to do to make progress. Guys, if I was to do more volume here, I would then, again, drop off the loading on the mid peg and go more to the top peg. So what I would do if I was sticking on this is that I would go one and a half plates on the middle and then I'd go three and a half on the top. Um, and I'd get another triple again. But that's all I'm doing for chest compound because I, I want to now move on to my shoulder compound movement. And if I did more volume here, I would then take away from my ability to be strong on my shoulder press volume. So for me right now, I only need two sets of compound chest work. Um, when I was at my absolute biggest and strongest, there sometimes would be a third, but, because of the way I see push sessions as a whole, in that the shoulder press movement, because it's a high incline, will still pull in upper chest fibers. There's still chest stimulus from that. But then in that one, there's just more anterior delt stimulus. And equally in the tricep compound movement, there's still decline chest fibers. You're still going to recruit various aspects of your chest through this motion, through this motion, through this motion. So, Really, actually, there's six compound sets that I'm going to do that will target my triceps, my chest, and my shoulders. But just the varying uh, positions that I take will bias the recruitment of those three muscles that I'm trying to do. So that's the way that I look at a push session, is that actually it's six sets of compound work that will hit all three, and then just slightly adjusting the angles as to what bias we get. And like I said, if I did an additional set here, I would take away from the amount of bias and effort that I can put into my next movement. Um, it's not the must way to do things, but I believe it to be a very effective way. So next I'm going to choose the Heinkai Smith. Um, I'm a little bit smaller than when I lasted this movement, so my setup feels a little strange. Uh, but this has a, an even resistance profile. So the resistance that you get at the top is not more than the bottom, which is perfect for this movement. The only kind of negative to this piece would be that it doesn't converge. Um, so in terms of kit selection, probably my absolute favorite that I would pick here would be the Atlantis shoulder press as the handles being ones that slightly turn your hands out and then with a slight converging aspect, I believe we'll get the best recruitment of the upper pec, upper pec fibers and the shoulder fibers. But then this would be probably my second favorite. Um, I actually prefer this to the prime shoulder press. And the reason being is because the prime shoulder press is a complete vertical press. So it's more like a behind the neck shoulder press. Whereas this allows me to tie in my upper pec fibers so that then I can approach the session as a whole. Now, what would potentially be an even better movement than this, which is what used, I used to do, would be the high incline dumbbell press variation um, because that allows you to converge. If you have someone to pass you up the dumbbells, then that's probably what I would pick. And if you look back to kind of my 2017 videos where I was again at my strongest on that, I was incline dumbbell pressing the 80 kilo dumbbells. So whatever that is in pounds, 175 pound dumbbells, around that, 180 pound dumbbells. Um, so 
now, because we're in here, for ease, I would then use the Smith machine. Um, and again, I'm gonna dead stop this movement just to take out the stretch reflex in the bottom uh, position of the movement. Uh, play with dead stopping because it's gonna standardize your pressing. And um, what I mean by that is that every rep has to be exactly the same. Um, and you cannot generate that stretch reflex force out the bottom. And it's not to say that's a bad thing, it's just that um, through different stints, utilize dead stops and then utilize your standard presses. Alright guys, so that's um, the volume done for that upper shelf portion. And then now, I'm actually going to go back onto the prime incline. And I'm going to now really exaggerate the tuck of my elbows to focus on a narrow grip press. Now, um, if I had a flat version, I'd probably choose that now at this point. Um, but I don't. So. I'm mean, using the incline again, but the reason being is because at this point now, my shoulders, chest and triceps are fatigued when it comes to my press ability. So right now, this would be the worst point possible for me to use a, a piece of kit that overloads in the shortened position because I'm gonna be entirely limited in terms of how much stimulus I can apply here by how much force I can produce here. And considering I still have lots of strength left here in this position, that would be a really poor choice to use a piece of uh, machine that then doesn't allow me to adjust my resistance profile. Now, for those of you that don't have resistance profile pieces that can be adjusted, again, I would probably do a flat, narrow grip smith, or I would use a standard dip machine or depending on how your body feels with them, standard free weight dips. But if you can use something that has an adjustable resistance profile, this is where then lengthening pretty much solely in the, the top peg or the um, lengthened position of the resistance profile is gonna allow you to use the most amount of load where you're still strongest, which is here, and then drop off where you're then actually now pretty weak and fatigued, which is here. Wow. <laughs> so guys, tricep focus, tucked elbows, during the eccentric portion of the lift, focusing on loading what we're really trying to target. Um, so again, my goals are somewhat different to yours, but I'm still doing this video with the, with the focus on your goals. And uh, mentally, I'm loading my triceps. So during that eccentric portion, I, I am really dialed in on what I am trying to grow. <laughs> so 
So guys, grip-wise, if, um, if we check out how I take my grip here, I've used a suicide grip in the sense that I haven't wrapped my thumb. Um, so my hand is really in on the U-bend. Um, so when I was kind of doing chest focus, my hand wasn't as far over as this. It was then more um, there. I still don't actually grip my thumb on the chest press either, but for that one, I had my hand all the way tight, which is allowed me to just keep that tight elbow pass just to focus on my triceps. So now for the sixth set, this is again where I'll adjust the resistance profile one more time and I'll only load in the lengthening position. This would be my last compound set um, unless I feel like my recovery capabilities would allow for something additional after this. Um, and then usually I decide that kind of at this point in the session with how I'm feeling and how my week's gone um, and how much volume I can get away with in reflection to my uh, frequency that I'm training at and then equally my intensity as well. So uh, for kind of the insight into your volume aspects, please check out the uh, education series and the second video where I talk about the kind of amount of volume relative to the frequency that you can do. Um, and we're obviously going to explore more on that topic, but today you get an insight to, to six sets, with the, which would be kind of like my uh, standard volume. And then I might do more or less for my compound work, depending on my recovery capabilities. We have a, we have a lot to cover in those videos. Like I, I, like I said in the introductory video, video, I want to make sure that you guys are fully armed with all of the information possible to make the best decisions possible for your training. <coughs> I, I keep explaining about rep ranges over and over and over, but how much am I gonna bet that one of the reoccurring themes in the comment section of this video is people critiquing the ultra low reps. So we are just use this opportunity to circle back and remind ourselves again that my goals are not the same as your goals, which are not the same as Corinne's goals, which are not the same as Jay's goals behind the camera, because Jay is uh, Mr. Wales, bodybuilder, so his goals are gonna be slightly different in the sense that he's gonna lift more reps than I am. And make sure you're training specific to your goals, which are gonna be into individual. Mine are different to yours, mine are different now versus then, and different to a different period of time. So guys, that sort of is perfect example of where you saw the weight stick. Now imagine I didn't have a machine in that moment that dropped off in resistance as I got to my weakest portion of the lift. You saw that the lift got hard here and I had to drive through it. If I was on a machine that overloaded the shortened aspect, so for example, let's say I was using a dip that had a chain on it, that meant that as I got closer to the fully contracted part, the resistance increased, I would not complete the rep because that's disproportionate to the strength that our muscles hold in their resistance profiles, in their strength profiles. So this is that, that last rep there was a perfect example of intelligent exercise selection and using resistance profiles that match our strength profiles to optimize progress. I'm not gonna do any additional compound volume, but I will kind of give you an insight into what I would do if I was going to add more. Like if I was to add more at this point, I would probably do a dip machine, and again, just focus on the lengthened portion, but how I would approach that movement would be to try to tie in my chest and my triceps and my shoulders by kind of getting quite over the machine and then contracting everything. Like that's if I was to add additional volume. Uh, but I'm not, I'm happy with my six sets of work. And this is where I'm gonna move on to my isolation components. And again, my volume for here will scale up or down based on my frequency and then based on the intensity aspects that I'm using, which right now are actually none, it's just straight sets to the point where I can't complete a rep without additional help. 
um, and then the overall aspect will be reflective of my recovery capabilities depending on the things I previously mentioned, my caloric surplus or deficit, uh, my sleep, my recovery, my hydration, all the things that we've kind of covered in the first two educational videos that I've talked about. Um, so circle back to those, get yourself up to date with those, just so you can kind of stay in touch with the things that I'm gonna talk about mid-session um, so you're always on board. And then if you have any questions, if anything I've said is confusing, ask, We'll make sure we get it all ironed out and that at any point things are very clear. During this kind of these video series, there'll be kind of Q&A sessions interspersed and we'll do those live and we'll make sure that everyone has all the information that they need to keep moving forward. I'm now on to the Prime Pet Deck. Now, how I actually like to use this is setting one to start with. Uh, and that's loading evenly through the resistance profile. Now, the reason why I don't go straight into just solely overloading the length and the position is I feel like on an isolation movement, I actually can kind of reset the way I feel in terms of getting things short. Um, so I actually do still feel like when it's just focusing on contracting the chest as hard as I can, that I do still then actually have some oomph in this position. Um, I've tried all different ways. I've tried solely going to just training the lengthening position and I, I, I actually then was able still to progress my lifts when I am focusing on setting one here. Now, would I have continued to use setting one if I felt like I wasn't able to make progress? No. So my logbook gives me my feedback in terms of smart exercise selection. So like I said to you, with the prime press, I couldn't overcome just mid-pegged logging mid peg, peg loading. Um, so then that was an indicator that the resistance profile selection was wrong. Because your logbook will always tell you what is right or wrong. Because if at certain points your volume is too high or your recovery capabilities are too low or a combination of the two, your logbook will stop progressing. And then that's where you then need to look back on what you're doing and understand, okay, which area is wrong. So for me now, setting one, for my chest isolation on the prime is where I would start. Why I don't like setting four or two in this point is I feel like there's just no resistance in the lengthened aspect at all. And then you're kind of just, you, it's only at this point that you start to feel any kind of resistance. And then I don't like the way that feels. For you, maybe try that and see how that feels. For me, I didn't really feel like I was getting anything out of the set when the tension only kind of kicks in at this point. And I feel like I'm only getting resistance from here to here. That for me, I think is nonsensical when we're exerting effort and we only have so much effort that we can exert in the sense that we can only do so much volume relative to our frequency. We want to use our volume wisely. So guys, you saw the aspect in which I failed. You see, because I've gone setting one, which means the resistance is slightly harder here than it is here. And equally, we're weaker here than we are here, especially as the session progresses. As the session progresses more and more, we are increasingly weaker here and retaining strength here. But I felt like I had enough oomph to justify that setting one to get to here. Now what I wanted to make sure was that once I got to this point, I didn't adjust my form just to get the rep closed, okay? Because I could feel once I got to rep eight that I was starting to lean into the reps more to get things short. Try to keep the reps standardized, okay? Full contraction of the muscle is what's key. And when you do that, focus on driving your humerus, your upper arm, together. It isn't just about getting your hands closed because I can actually create an angle here where I close my hands, but I'm not fully shortening the pec. That 
is fully shortening the pec here. I'm going to adjust the resistance profile to just overload now and the lengthen because when I get to this point here, I need the exercise to drop off to allow me to get it fully short. Now, what do you do if you don't have something that adjusts here? This is where you're gonna have a manual help, okay? So, someone, once you get to this point and you can't fully get it short, someone's gonna do that work slightly with you. And you might just do two reps, just getting it fully short with some additional hands-on work. So guys, one of the main differences you'll have noticed between that section of the workout and the first part, my reps were higher. Um, and that really is actually just for a safety thing. I'm happy to drop my reps on sub subsequent sets, but for isolation movements, I typically will actually lift things in slightly higher reps compared to my compound movements um, on the first set. Uh, I, I will be happy to do six to eight reps on subsequent sets, but I won't go below five reps very often on an isolation movement unless I fucked up my loading. Um, so the, the, the risk to reward benefit is just simply not there. So I can't justify it. For maximal strength work on my compound movement, 100%, because I'm trying to be literally as strong and as explosive as I can be. That's, that's my sole goal. But for this, because um, I, I am extremely conscious of my rep ranges confusing people, which is why I keep revisiting that topic at any one point. So then you can take what you need relative to your goals. Um, so for the isolation movements, I do feel that training in slightly higher rep ranges is going to allow you to connect with your musculature better. It's going to allow you to increase blood flow to muscles more efficiently, which we do know will yield greater hypertrophy benefits. Obviously the loading component is the king, so the, the, uh, in terms of mechanisms of hypertrophy, we know that lifting more weight will yield the best results, but equally there are benefits to increase blood flow to muscles. my chest isolation movement done. Uh, again, just two sets. I could do more work there um, if my chest, I believe, would be a, a perceived weakness. That would be a reason to maybe add more volume to that. Uh, with the isolation work, with the isolation work that you do, if you are going to add volume, potentially add it to areas that need more focus first. Um, so, uh, yeah, if your chest is a perceived weakness, that's where slightly more work could yield better results. But equally, that doesn't then mean that you add a silly amount and you start doing then five, six sets of chest isolation work on top of what is already six sets of compound work. Although, like I said, those sets aren't all direct work, there is chest stimulus coming from all of them. So the way that I look at this session now is that I've done eight sets so far in this session, but eight of those sets have brought stimulus to my chest. That's more than enough when you're then training it at every four or five day frequency. Now, with this side deal, which we're going on to now, that hasn't really been challenged in any of the movements that we've done so far. So this is where you need to bring maybe four to five working sets, in my opinion, specifically to that muscle to ensure that they're getting the volume necessary they need relative to the individual development. Now, if you were a beginner and you were just doing upper body, sorry, you were just doing full body training, you probably only need one set of side delts and then you can do that every other day. And if you're doing just an upper body training, you might only need two sets of side delts. But then once you get to push pull legs, this is where you'll probably need four or five sets. And then with the split body part training, where you're training things at maybe only once a week frequency, there's, there's propensity there to train the side delts with seven or eight sets in a work session. However, 
The side delts are a body part that have incredible recovery capabilities. And regardless of your training split approach, they're a body part that I actually would always look to tag on at additional frequency, just because of their recovery capabilities. Um, and then if you're having a question as to why they are a body part that is able to recover so easily, it's because it's actually really difficult to eccentrically load the side delt and cause an overwhelming amount of muscular damage. We get greater damage and greater recovery capability during eccentric movements and movements that uh, load in the lengthened position. So obviously at the bottom of a chest press movement, we have lots of load in the lengthened position. This is cause, causes lots of damage. During a side lateral, during the eccentric, even here on a cable, once our arm is down to here, the loading is average. Um, and with a dumbbell, there's zero. So our ability to train that body part at high frequency is pretty high. If we consider this, guys, to be essentially the first bit of exposure the side delt gets to um, stimulus during the training session, and then we think about the concepts that we discussed throughout the whole training session, that muscles are strong in their shortest position when they haven't received any fatigue. That means that right now, our side delts have strength in that shortened, contracted position. So how can we maximally utilize that right now on a cable machine that has more of an even resistance profile? The answer is, is that we spend a slight bit of time in that contracted position. So for that first set, what we're gonna do is we're gonna pause in the contraction for just a two count. That's not a full two seconds, it's just your own standardized two count. It could be two seconds, if you're happy to do that and that feels good for me, I'll get there and I'll just go one, two, and I'll come back down. Second set guys, um, again, still some ability to generate some force in the shortened position. So for this set, I'm gonna hold for just a one count. I've gone up slightly in weight, so my reps might slightly drop, but because I'm holding for a one count, equally they might stay. But the important aspect here is that we have slightly less strength in that shortened position, so I, I don't wanna waste time spending too much time there, but I definitely want to ensure that I am getting a really strong contraction in that position. Next set guys, again, I've gone up slightly in weight, and for this one, there's gonna be no hold in the shortened position. So now I'm just gonna do continuous reps, keeping the form precise, making sure I'm staying on my side delt, but now at this point, uh, no pausing there. For those sets guys, for those reps, once I feel myself starting to throw my body into it, that's typically the set over for me. Um, just because when it comes to standardizing your reps, ensuring that progression is true progression, if we want to make sure that that external stimulus increase equates to a greater internal stimulus, that we make sure that we're not just getting extra reps by just chucking our body into it. So that was set three. Um, what we're going to do for set four and five is we're going to hop onto a machine then that has 
and adjust adjustable resistance profile. Now, if you don't have something that drops off in the short, because now at this point, I still have lots of strength from here to here, but much less here, then what I would do again is I would have someone just help you with forced reps, just to get to that additional point, just for like the last two or three reps. I would also probably decrease the weight and then train in a different rep range. I don't have to do that because I'm gonna use a machine that will then drop off and allow me to complete the reps on my own. So setting three now guys for this, where then the load is heavier in the lengthened position and then decreased in the shortened position. If I was just to start on this machine, I would have worked through probably settings one to start, then five, then three. Sometimes I would use maybe setting four to start, but the reason I don't love those is the same reason I sit on the pec deck, in that I don't like there being very limited resistance in the start of the exercise, just because it seems just like wasted volume to me. It seems like the equivalent of junk volume. For me, if I was trying to increase the size of my side delts, or, or for example, when I had my side delts to their absolute biggest, five sets was the most amount of volume that I needed. And then I could replicate that every four days or every five days, depending on when I gave myself the sleeps, um, depending on how you're gonna set up your push-pull legs training. But there are, there are, I have two preferences in the way that I would set up a push-pull leg training. It would just be your straight push-pull legs rest or when you run into recovery difficulties with that you place your rest days around either side of the leg day so then it will look push pull rest legs rest which seems like a lot of rest but once you are used to training incredibly hard with high intensity and you're then also pretty strong those rest days are going to allow you to maximize the training sessions more so but we'll get into the, the specific nuances of those setups and their varied applications in the education series when we focus on how to maneuver through each individual training split. All I'm gonna do is come down slightly in weight now and just try to beat the reps that I did in that previous set. So I'm still on setting three on the prime. I'm still overloading in the length and it's still dropping off in the short end, but I'm just now just gonna try and get a couple more reps than I did for the last set by just lowering the weight slightly. my tricep isolation movement but I'm actually going to do it on a dip machine um, but I'm going to try to really focus my loading specifically on my triceps um, so although technically this would be considered a compound movement the way that you execute this you can you can very much on a dip machine target your triceps in an isolation fashion now if the triceps are a body part for you that maybe struggles to grow, I maybe wouldn't advise this particular machine in this instance because they're struggling to grow possibly because your other pushing muscles are being more dominant. So then when you choose a further compound movement, you're then going to struggle to emphasize your triceps to do the work because they've already told you that they aren't a dominant muscle because they aren't getting the hypertrophy that your other pushing muscles are. Um, for me, throughout my bodybuilding period, my triceps were able to grow proportionately to my chest and my shoulders. I was quite fortunate in the, um, at, when I was at my biggest, there was no disparity between those body parts. So I know that if I then, from an internal stimulus perspective, focus on loading my triceps when I do this movement, 
I'm going to get what I need from this. Whereas if I didn't, then I would have an isolation movement on top. Um, so factor that in when it comes to your exercise selection. Uh, the reason why I'm choosing this as well is because it allows me again to adjust the resistance profile because my triceps are pretty fatigued in general from the work that I've done in the session. So getting them really short with a strong contraction is going to be a little bit harder. So then this machine allows me to adjust that based on kind of how they're feeling in the moment. Some sessions I find that actually I was still had some fairly strong tricep contraction at the end of the session in this way. And then my resistance profile setting will reflect that. Whereas for you, you may find that actually at this point, it's really hard to get your triceps fully contracted. And then uh, you can then go to setting three on this machine. So for this now, with uh, uh, the focus of really contracting my triceps hard in an isolation fashion, I'm going to start on setting one. Again, with this piece, guys, I actually like to dead stop this. Um, I feel like it enables me to reconcentrate every rep on the loading of my triceps because when you dead stop, you have to control the eccentric slightly in the, you can't just let the machine clatter. Um, and then at the start of every rep, you can also then focus a little more on what you're trying to contract. So with the dip machine, I definitely find the dead stop variation when I am trying to use it as an isolation movement, um, the most prudent choice uh, when it comes to your execution. So again, with that machine, with that exercise, you saw at what point I couldn't complete the rep. It was in the shortened position. Um, so then that's where I'm now, when I get to adjust the resistance profile, it means I can fully complete the rep. I've adjusted to number three, setting three. Um, so this is where, with that point where I hit here, where I couldn't get it short, the machine will then drop off and allow me to get short and equally the resistance is quite noticeable on the machine and how much there is in the length and even on these pin loaded machines uh, when you start the rep there's a lot more force that you need to produce here to get the weight going but that's fine because as I explained previously in the training session that we still have a lot of force here and nowhere near as much here so again the absolute worst possible exercise that we could pick right now would be something like a chain dip um, or any kind of press down that then biases that overloaded contraction here. Um, so like a single armed cable push down at this point in the training session would be the worst possible option that we could choose. Um, something like uh, if you didn't have this piece would be a single armed dumbbell overhead extension where there's lots of resistance in the stretch where we're still strong and then basically nothing once we're overhead would be ideal. So that would be a great choice. So again, we need to make smart choices in regards to our exercises that reflect our strength profiles as sessions continue. If you were doing an arm session, the very first exercise, the very first set of the session, the best possible movement you could probably do would be a chained dip. Where then, and that lockout, the overload is there where you've got loads of lockout strength. But in a session like this, as you get on with more fatigue, that would be the worst possible. And again, the most nonsensical exercise you could do as a start point for an arm session would be the opposite. It would be that lengthened position with a single arm dumbbell overhead. That would make no sense whatsoever. So pick your exercises wisely, and that's what I'm gonna try to teach you to make the most out of every single training session you do. So from the first exercise to the last exercise, you create the largest stimulus possible in your training session.
So that's my session done guys. So when we recap, we did six compound movements that all kind of contributed to chest, shoulder and tricep hypertrophy. We then did, but with their biases in regards to which movements you picked. Then we did two sets of chest isolation, five sets of side delt isolation, and then two further sets of tricep isolation. So 12 total working sets for a push session, which is very much on the, the low to moderate end when it comes to a training session. Um, so that's a wrap now. All I have for me, which I'm not gonna film for you guys, is I have uh, 20 minutes on the assault bike, um, just to keep my cardio levels high. And then my second session of the day will be Jiu Jitsu tonight. Um, and for those that are kind of more interested in my particular training at the moment and what I'm doing, you can follow that on the Train by JP members site. For here in these sessions, my sole focus is going to be doing the right things to help you with yours. Um, so I'm not gonna give you as many insights into what I'm personally doing because that might be a little boring for you guys because the emphasis really is about you and it's absolutely nothing to do about me. So I hope you enjoyed this training session and I'll see you guys soon.